Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to my presentation. Uh, this presentation is about story of a Australian ISP and how they were trying to deal with their big data and how we, with a very small team, were able using, uh, by using BigQuery and Dataflow to help them to finally get useful insights out of it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about myself first. Uh, so I didn't mention before, my name is Pablo Caif. Uh, I'm a software engineer. I've been in the industry for a bit longer than 13 years. Uh, and I work for Shine Technologies. Shine Technologies is a consultancy company based in Melbourne, Australia, or Down Under, as you call it here. Um, and uh, we basically help customers. And one of our customers, the customer of, of this story, is Telstra. I'm also a Google developer expert for the Google Cloud Platform. And although I come from Australia, I'm sorry to tell you it's not going to be Australian accent here, because I'm originally from uh, Argentina. So plenty of Spanish accent here. OK, so let's talk a little bit about Telstra. So Telstra, it's uh, one of the largest uh, ISP and mobile operator in Australia. They, they own most of the uh, mobile network and the actual telephone network in Australia. And they provide services like uh, home internet access, mobile access, uh, net um, broadband access as well. And they have a lot of accounts, customers, uh, between you know, home internet access and uh, mobile access and stuff like that. They have more than 20 million accounts. Uh, and if, you, if we take into account that people in Australia, the population is 24 million, that's a fair share. They are a very large opera, uh, you know, company. They have more than 32,000 uh, employees, and they make a lot of money. Uh, but there is something particular about them, which is that they have a lot of data to process. So. All the stuff that I'm going to tell you is actually about a, a smaller business unit of Telstra, uh, which is Telstra Media. And they are a, a big digital publisher. Um, and what they do is they, they own uh, several you know, very high profile websites in Australia. And as many as you might know, in Australia, sports, we, we like sports quite a lot. So two of these websites are the AFL, the Australian Football League, and the NRL, the National Rugby League. And these websites, especially in, when they're in season, games are being played and stuff like that, you can imagine the people is constantly checking the results and stuff like that, so they get a lot of traffic. Uh, so around 5,000 requests per second, which is quite a lot. And also, if you would imagine, you know, the websites, they have the central space with all the information, uh, you know, stuff that would be of interest. But they also have digital real estate, space that they take advantage of. So what do they do with this space? They put lots and lots of ads. So um, what they do with these ads is basically um, they uh, use targeted advertising to generate revenue. And this targeted advertising, it's uh, basically through uh, basic demographics, uh, and which means that we have several data points. The way that they are able to serve the ads is using uh, Google Clip for Publishers, or DFP, as an ad server. 
And every time an ad is being shown, that's, a, that's what we call impression, uh, or someone clicks on an ad, uh, we get a log entry. And that log entry contains a lot of very interesting data points that we can use. And they make a lot of, actually, information out of it. So imagine 15,000 requests per second, you know, hitting our pages, web pages. If we were trying to collect all this stuff, it would turn into 5 billion impressions per month, or something around like 3 terabytes per month of information. Uh, just to put it in perspective, the edge of our sand is 4.5 billion years. So, let's put everything into context. Uh, it was the year 2007, almost 10 years ago, and our customer Telstra, they say, why don't we start getting some useful information out of all these, you know, logs, all this stuff we, we generating? But they found out that it wasn't that easy to do back in that time uh, using DFP, because you know, imagine business people trying to generate these uh, reports. It was time consuming. Uh, the stuff that we're trying to find out, it was very difficult to find such a large amount of data. And whenever they were able to get you know, anything out of it, it took them a long time. And one of the things that they were finding a bit limiting was also, uh, you know, the, the, they, there wasn't any out-of-the-box visualizations that they, they could use. So they call us and they say, you know, can you help us? So we've been working with them before, uh, and we decided to assemble a team. So this business unit of Telstra is a relatively uh, independent business unit. They have their own budget uh, and they can do certain innovation. So we assemble the team, just two engineers, one BA, and that was all we had. So we say, okay, how we can, you know, tackle this problem? So we try to analyze all this data. And we did with you know, anyone would do back in 2007, try to put it in data warehouses. You know, Oracle instances using uh, servers, like renting our own servers rack and stack infrastructure, which a lot of headaches, of course, because it wasn't really, you know, easy to get a, every time we wanted a new server, it could take six months to get it approved, and then another maybe three months until we finally would get the actual server and then configuration, stuff like that, which takes time and is expensive. And there was, the demand of data was such a huge amount of data that we were only able to look and analyze just the 10%. Imagine trying to run queries on an Oracle instance like, you know, data warehouse and stuff like that. And it turned out that it was very costly for this business unit. And one of the major problems they had is every time we were getting more data, it was hard to scale. As I said before, getting a new server, waiting six to eight months to get it actually in, and even paying for some stuff that we might not be using all the time. So uh, at a very high level, this is how our solution looked like. So we had the uh, request come into our, our web pages. Um, and we were using, as I mentioned before, double click for publishers to serve the ads. And we were importing all these logs and trying to put them in these data warehouses. But things didn't really work as we expected. We ended up a little bit like this, putting out fires all the time. So you can see there the two engineers and the VA. Uh, so things like, you know, running out of space on, on the database, having to contact DBAs to, you know, resize table spaces, 
uh, having hard drives breaking down and someone calling us and telling us, look, your old data, you, you, you're not going to be able to use all this data until probably two or three days until we recover all the backups and everything is back online. Uh, it wasn't really easy. So we came to realize that we were caring too much about all this infrastructure. It was a huge overload for us to try to you know, take care of all these situations, but we really wanted to get results out of all this data. That was all we really cared. So back in 2007, we found ourselves in a dead end. Moving this data from DFP to our internal infrastructure was very difficult and it took a long time. We uh, saturated all the networks because all the traffic we were generating, so we were constantly getting calls and people annoyed because you know, everything was running slow. And trying to run queries over such huge amount of data, it was really, really slow. And I'm not talking about minutes or hours. It might take days, we might just you know, kick off a query, come back the next day and hope that it will actually finish. Sometimes it might just crash and we would have to contact DBA so they could you know, tune the database a little bit more. So back in 2007, this problem was really, really big for us and we didn't really know what to do. So we found ourselves drawn in all this data but trying desperately to get insights out of it. So a long time after that, we, we basically put this in a drawer or in a back burner, as we say in Australia. 2012, several years later, things have changed quite a lot. So Google was offering uh, cloud services, and this is what they were offering back in 2012. Uh, we heard about a few things up engine, um, cloud storage, but we noticed something very interesting there, which was BigQuery. So with the other engineer, we started you know, researching, saying, what is this BigQuery thing? Uh, I'm sure you've heard quite a lot about BigQuery already. You know, it's been, this is the second day, actually, of, the, of GCP Next. I'm just going to tell you uh, what was very interesting for us. So it's an analytic as a service. And this was a very important point for us. No ops. So, you know, stop worrying about infrastructure and problems and situations like that. You don't, we didn't need to think on installing BigQuery anywhere or setting up clusters or configuring things or anything of that. Just create an account, put in the data, and query in the data. It was able to, it's able to, ex, to scale to pendabytes which is what we were looking for. And it has a SQL interface. So as I mentioned before, we were using you know, Oracle, we were familiar with SQL. It was perfect for us. We could just you know, pretty much use the same syntax and get the data out. And it's really, really fast. So we wonder ourselves, can we actually you know, use this BigQuery tool to solve all this problem we were having back in 2007? So we removed the dust off of the whole problem, took it out, and started thinking. And we found out that it was possible, there was a way of solving all this problem. So we were able to get all these logs, at serving logs from DoubleClick for publishers, and put them in cloud storage. And since with BigQuery, it's very easy to import data directly from cloud storage using, you know, getting CSV files. And we put everything in BigQuery. And then we connected it to uh, Tableau. And we were finally able to get the insights out. So, all of these you know, impossible things we couldn't achieve before all of a sudden became possible. We were able to move the data extremely fast because we were 
you know, within the same infrastructure. We didn't need to download that as we were doing before. We stopped worrying so much about the infrastructure. No more calling DBAs, no more breaking networks or uh, broke down servers or stuff like that. Our costs exponentially reduced. And these long hours or maybe days hoping that a query would finish all of a sudden turn into seconds. Just imagine seconds to get your results out. And this allowed our customer Telstra to get extremely fast time to get their insights out of all these logs. Uh, another very interesting things we found using BigQuery were that it was great for doing ad hoc reports. So I remember once uh, the VA came to me and said, I'm about to go to a very important meeting with the stakeholders and I need to query around two or three years worth of data. Can you do it? Yes, just sit there, write some SQL, there you go. Uh, as I mentioned before, very easy to move the data from DFP to BigQuery because it was all within Google infrastructure. And we were using Java. We're still using Java for most of the stuff we do. So it was very natural for us to use the SDK. So uh, as you might know, BigQuery has an SDK in Java, Python, and a few other languages. So we're using Java SDK. And it was really cost effective for us. But how cost effective? So if you just try to you know, calculate, paying for DBAs, paying for your servers, paying for uh, people looking after the whole infrastructure, I don't think you can get it for any less than, I don't know, 40, 50 k per month. For us, it ended up being just 1,500 per month per 100 terabytes, pretty cheap. So uh, I'm going to tell you a few things we learned uh, when we were using BigQuery that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one very interesting thing we found about was the cache. So it was very useful for us to save money. So BigQuery has a uh, allows you to cache the result of the queries. So when you run a query, uh, if you display the query options and tick that use uh, cache results, uh, it will basically cache the results. And next time you run the query, you won't pay for that. So this, here is an example. Uh, this query will process 11.5 gigabytes. So when it runs, it takes two seconds and as is as I told us before, it actually processed 11.5 gigabytes. But when we run it the second time, you can see that the results just come from the cache. So you don't pay for the process to process that data again. Uh, another very useful thing we found was the table decorators. Table decorators allow you to get a uh, snapshot of your data, and it's very useful for when you're, uh, you have a table where you're constantly streaming information in. So uh, for example, this table, if I do select star, which is not a recommended thing to do, is going to process, going to go through four, 460 gigabytes. And if I put the table decorator in, uh, just to restrict the last hour, you see how it gets drastically, drastically reduced to 67 megabytes. Another thing we found very useful was um, the, the idea of start with small data sets. So uh, when you're writing your queries and you're trying to figure out how you, you want to have your SQL and you need to join to several tables and stuff like that, uh, it's always a good idea to save the data to a, an, an, an small table, like just maybe 1,000 rows, 100,000, or something like that. So you can see here, for example, if I was to play with this table, 
For example, just doing that query would take, would process 11.5 gigabytes. However, if I save only 1,000 records, the table gets reduced to 38 kilobytes, which is completely different. Um, and this is the last tip for BigQuery. Uh, another thing we found very useful is as we were using BigQuery, it's very easy to forget tables along the way. So you, you play with tables, you get several gigabytes of worth of data in tables. So a neat thing is actually use the time to live feature that it can also be used in uh, data sets. But here is an example on the table if I'm using the Java SDK. So just set it expiration time, in this case it's just a minute. And once you apply the change, the table will be removed. So it's very good when you have in temporary tables, you can just set an expiration time. And I just want to reiterate, just two engineers. That was the team. So we decided to move to the next stage, right? We had all this stuff going, getting all the logs from DFP, and we say, why not, why not try in you know, real time? We immediately started seeing a few uh, very interesting things about it. So one thing would be the, ad, uh, the campaign managers would be able to get very quick feedback about their, how the ads were going. And as a consequence of that, they would be able to modify if maybe they weren't targeting the right uh, demographics, they wanted to change something, they were able to change it on the fly. And that allowed the business to actually move with the data, make decisions as the things were actually happening, not after they happened. And this batch processing we were doing before of you know, taking data out of uh, DFP. It was great, but it was running every night and it had a slow turnaround time. And a very interesting thing for us was the wow factor. So imagine seeing a map of Australia, a heat map with different points where you're getting your impressions by geolocation and, you know, distributing the population or maybe showing, you know, the, uh, the if it was tablet, desktop, or, uh, or mobile phones. So we decided to use uh, the uh, streaming stuff that BigQuery has. Uh, so BigQuery has a streaming API. And the way we implemented this was creating a very simple uh, JavaScript tag that it was basically just pinging the one very simple uh, server app, and every time someone was, uh, you know, seeing an ad or maybe visiting a website, that was directly pinging our server. That way, impressions and clicks were directly streamed to BigQuery. And in order to be able to see results uh, much more easily and, not, and save money. We were using table decorators so we could reduce the threshold of data we were querying, so maybe just about the last 10 minutes so you could see much bigger changes. And then we built a, a dashboard using D3. D3 is a JavaScript uh, library for you know, doing that, um, graphs and stuff like that. And this is how our solution looked at a very, very high level. So as I mentioned before, we had our, uh, the request hitting our servers. We deploy our app to uh, App Engine. And then we were streaming every, every single request to, uh, with all this log information directly to BigQuery. And here is a demo of uh, part of the app. So let me show you how it works. So what you can see there, there is each dot. It's uh, several impressions, actually, in that geographic zone, geographic area. Uh, 
and you can see there how we actually splitting the whole uh, the whole amount, the total impressions by um, state in Australia, and we're also getting an average of impressions per minute and splitting between mobile, tablet, and online. Online will be the desktop. Uh, so let's move to the back to the slides. Again, just two engineers. That was the team, just two of us. Okay, so things are going to went really interesting. You know, we were able to first analyze all this amount of data, process it, and get inside the mirror to using BigQuery, and then have this streaming thing going on. And um, uh, they, the, the business started realizing how powerful BigQuery was. So they engaged data scientists, uh, and what they wanted to do is to alter the distribution in the sample set to be more representative of the audience, so complex statistical things. Uh, we gave them an extract of our data, and they went away, did some simulations and stuff like that, and they came back with a, a statistical model, very simple, just half a page, simple maths, which is, get it done, we got it done in around, you know, maybe half an hour, just 20 lines of SQL, it was there. And our customer Telstra was really happy, but they wanted more. So we gave, them, we gave more data to the data scientists, data scientists went away, ran their simulations again, and after three, four months, they came back with something like this. A crazy complex thing. So we were completely lost. Something like 30 pages uh, of specifications, operations, uh, aggregations at several levels. Uh, the way that this model worked, it needed to access billions of rows to derive these deeper insights they wanted to get out. And it became too complex to be written in SQL. And one of the things we were actually trying to do is, you know, being able to have something that it could go to, you know, be a maintainable product, just release it to production and use it. So we wanted to have unit tests, write unit tests, being able to have something we could work and iterate on it. And we started realizing that we needed kind of, you know, the map reduce style of analysis to solve these kind of problems. And that's when uh, Dataflow came to us. So this is actually part of a funny story. Um, as part of all these interesting adventures we have with BigQuery, we engage uh, part of the Google engineers that work on BigQuery. And they, uh, they were, this is back 2000 and 2014, after 2014, beginning of 2015, uh, back then, Dataflow was uh, in alpha, early alpha access. So they invited us to start testing and playing with Dataflow, and we found that it was really, really great for what we needed. Of course, now Dataflow is in production, uh, generally available. Just uh, gonna, again, you probably heard a lot about Dataflow already. Just gonna quickly tell you, uh, it's massively parallel and scalable, so you can run complex operations at scale. It sits at a higher level than MapReduce. Uh, so all the stuff you basically uh, do with MapReduce, imagine that you get a higher level of abstraction with much more common operations, and you can actually chain common things like uh, group by or uh, maybe um, simple transformations or stuff like that together. And it has a service part and an SDK. It's great for doing ETL, but it, was, it is also really, really good for doing complex analysis. And that's what we really needed, you know, doing this complex, resolving this complex problem. 
And a very interesting thing is that it's fully managed. Again, no worries about infrastructure. We didn't need to install any Hadoop or install or configure clusters or do anything, any sort of thing that. So imagine just two developers, just two software engineers who couldn't really try to do that. And it's very cost efficient. So we went and implemented our model using Dataflow. And this is how our solution looked like. So we still had you know, the batch side of the thing, the, the, the solution, just getting the logs out of DFP, putting them in BigQuery, and then taking advantage of the streaming side, we got all the data from BigQuery. We implemented our statistical model using Dataflow and put all the results back to BigQuery. And then we were finally able to get insights, these insights we were looking for. Unfortunately, I can't really tell you too much about this model because it's under NDA. Uh, so I really like to tell you more, but yeah, that's the reality of it. And uh, in terms of the cost, imagine, imagine a game, you know, trying to manage big clusters, uh, having people helping you with the infrastructure or maybe to set up operating system or installing Hadoop or anything like that. You can't really get for anything lower than probably, I don't know, 30 k or something per month. For us, it was only $700 per month and we are processing around 50 terabytes. So let's move to a few data flow tips, things we learned when we were using data flow. So a few things we found that it's not a good idea to try to do. Uh, you need to be aware of long running operations when you're writing your transforms. So as you might know, transforms are actually uh, the atomic operations you do. You get a input data. You do something with the data, and then you output the result. And you need to be aware that this, can, this will run multiple times, and it will scale with your data. If you have billions of rows, it will, or you're trying to read from BigQuery, and you have billions of rows, you will actually be doing this billion times. So if you're trying to go to the network and do something, it's not going to be a good idea. It's going to turn out pretty slow. Uh, it's not possible to put everything in memory. So if you're trying to process two terabytes, don't try to put it in memory. That's something that maybe the data scientists coming from a complete different background were doing. And for us, it was a challenge to adapt the whole thing in a more distributed way. Uh, and Dataflow has a P collection that can that really serve for that aspect. And another thing that you need to be aware of is the uh, hotkeys. The hotkeys are, come from a very con common operation you do with uh, Dataflow, which is, uh, for example, group by key, where you have a key, and that key might have several uh, actual uh, values matching with their key, like millions of them. So if you see you know, your graph and you see your uh, computer uh, instance running, you see that they are very high. Two or three might have very high CPU, and the others are idle. That means you have a hotkey. And there are solutions for that. I'm going to touch about that later. Um, a good thing when you're working with Dataflow is to take advantage of the local runner. So Dataflow has several runners. Uh, when you start working with a, you know, when we were developing this model, we, of course, started with small data sets and, you know, writing our program and testing it and going through small iterations. And then you can actually move to the TCP runner. So this is a good way to deal with the hotkeys. So, for example, when you need to do something like aggregations over this large set of data, um, you can actually uh, use the combined functions. So the combined functions allow you to uh, basically distribute this uh, 
values that you have for several keys in, into worker nodes, and it, teach, it shows data flow the, the semantics of your, of your problem, of your program that you're trying to implement. So they have several steps. You basically initialize the accumulators. You define accumulators to where you will be doing something like, for example, summing the values. And then you need to have a function that I will uh, add each element to the accumulators. And then, of course, you need to merge. And then you might merge again, and then you extract the output. And this is how it looks in code. Uh, you need to extend from the combined function, and specify inputs, uh, accumulator type, and output type. And you got there the initialize function, uh, the add inputs, merge accumulators, and extract outputs. And when you want to use it, just basically use the combine per key and create an instance of your, uh, of your combined function. The composite transforms. This is another one that we found really useful. So as I was telling you, this model is pretty complex, several aggregations, several levels, joins, and stuff like that. Um, we, once we actually finished implementing the whole thing, it was a big mess. A lot of nodes connecting each other, completely crazy. So composite transforms allow you to group related operations, and you can have something much easier to digest. So the way you, to implement is uh, you extend the speed transform class and specify an input type, output type, uh, and then you chain the two transforms together. So for example, here we, we're having a, uh, a initial transform that we put in this case, uh, P collection, and then we apply a second transform on top of it, and we, result, we return the results. And we went for something like that, and this is just a small portion of the whole big model to just one node. And you can see how much simpler it gets. And again, I want to reiterate, the team was just two engineers. Just the two of us trying to deal with this big problem. So uh, at the moment, what we're doing now is uh, we're trying to move from a batch mode, because the model was basically conceived in a batch mode, to an, the natural evolution we would be in a streaming mode. So you know, our data scientists are taking more data, and they are running their simulations and stuff like that, uh, so we can actually move to the next stage. So just to wrap up. Telstra was having a lot of issues trying to analyze all this amount of data they had. By using BigQuery, we were finally able to allow them to extract useful insights out of all this amount of data. When we were given this very complex model, data flow allows to actually implement it in a way that it could be maintainable and we could iterate on, on it. And using GCP gave us access to a very powerful and scalable infrastructure, infrastructure at a fraction of the cost compared to actually you know, rolling out our own infrastructure or renting infrastructure from Telstra. And we didn't really need a big team. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs>